you arrive in a place like that, this is Auschwitz, the selection platform. The train came in under this building and we had no idea where we were. All we knew was that we were in Germany, which was very bad news. Mm -hmm. Because during the occupation for four years, we heard a lot of rumors that Jews were being taken to Germany and murdered. So our one hope was that we would never be taken to Germany. And our hope vanished. Because as we asked, as the train was going, we would, and we would stop at the station, we would ask for water. It was the end of May of 1944, about 68 years ago. And so by the time the train stopped, we asked for water again. And this time there was no answer in any language. First, the answer came out in Hungarian until we crossed the border into Germany when it came in German, and this is the way we knew that we were not being taken to a labor camp in Hungary, but we were being taken to Germany to be murdered. So by the time we stepped down from the cattle car on this railroad, these railroad tracks, actually it was, our track was on that track, um, we didn't know where we were, but we knew we were in Germany, and then the cattle car doors opened, and people poured out of the cattle car, and everything was moving very fast. So my mother grabbed my twin sister and me by the hand. We were her youngest children, and she was hoping that as long as she could hold on to us, that she could protect us. Everything was moving very fast, and everything was very confusing. And I was on that selection platform maybe 10 minutes, when in my childish curiosity I looked around, trying to figure out what that place was, when I realized that my father and two older sisters had disappeared in the crowd. Then as we were holding on to my mother, a Nazi was running yelling in German twins, we did not volunteer any information. He approached us and uh, demanded to know if we were twins. We were dressed alike and we looked alike. And my poor mother didn't know what to say. She asked if that was good. And the Nazi said yes, and my mother said yes. And so she was pulled in one direction. We were pulled in the other direction. We were crying. She was crying. I remember seeing her arms stretched out in despair as she was pulled away. I never got to say goodbye to her, but at that time, I did not know that that would be the last time that we would see her. Otherwise, I probably would have run back, risking beating or whatever, to say goodbye to her. When your life is on the line, you will do everything and anything within your power 
your instinct to survive is so strong that it takes over all your personality. And if it helped, if I needed to run somewhere to get to buy, to buy, to steal some food or organize some food, that's what I would do. If it holding on to Miriam helped one another. So when was life normal then? And I stayed in the army eight years. And I liked it because I was stationed in Tel Aviv. I had a good job. Uh, I wore uniform every morning and therefore I didn't have to worry about what I'm wearing to work, which is a big worry for most girls, most women. And then uh, in 1960, I met an American tourist from Terre Haute, Indiana. He's also a survivor. He was liberated by an American from Terre Haute. And he wanted to come here. And uh, I married him, I came here, and um, I arrived here June 6, and April 27, I had my first baby. So I don't know what's normal. See, <laughs> I would like to know when does normal start? That is not a normal state of mind. And then again, with the children, we have two children. As they became old enough to know what's going on around in the world, they asked me a uh, little birthday when they were three, four, five year old, where is my grandma? And my husband is a survivor whose family was also killed, so there are no grandparents. And uh, so I told them that uh, there were some bad people, the Nazis.